Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. We're going to look at, we're down to the last part, believe it or not, of this series. We're going to look at the last piece of weaponry that Paul covers in Ephesians. I know you're probably wondering what was it. You thought we were done. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Praying always. Now listen, Paul lists all of the armory. Amen, that you have as a believer. They work individually. Amen, to cause you to grow spiritually, to walk closely with God. Amen. But they are also come together as one mighty force to do ultimately what you are called to do in the kingdom of God, and that's pray. That is our primary job as warriors. Amen. So he, he begins to sum it up in verse 18 and says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In the Spirit. In the Spirit. Now, that can be praying by Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit give you exactly what to pray for. But that's also primarily praying in other tongues. The Bible said in, in uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 14, he that speaking in the unknown tongue, speaking not, them, not unto men, but unto God, how be it in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Another translation says divine secrets. Amen. Jude says, ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost or praying in other tongues or praying in the Spirit. Amen. Then he says, and watching thereunto. This is where we watch. This is where we get the eyes of an eagle in our time of prayer. We all become watchers. Amen. There are watchers in heaven. There are heavenly beings that sits on the edge of the universe and they declare and decree the purpose of God. Guess what? They can declare all day long, but if they don't get the watchers on the earth to birth the will of God, nothing will happen. You know what I'm saying? Daniel chapter 9 and verse 10, Daniel read the writings of Jeremiah and some of the other prophets, and he saw that they were coming upon the 70-year mark. The 70-year mark. Amen. 2017 was also the year of the 70. Amen. 70 years Israel's anniversary. So he saw. When he saw the will of God, then what happens? Now you got to understand, you have a whole lot of more equipment than Daniel had. All of the gifts of the spirit were operation under the old covenant except tongues and interpretation of tongues. So you, go, you can go as a believer today, go one step farther than what Daniel did. Daniel had to pray in his known language. He had to know exactly what the will of the Lord was to pray. So he was praying in the spirit. But you can pray in the spirit, pray in other tongues, and you can hit the bullseye every single time. Amen. Amen. We come together and we worship, amen. You get in the spirit, you, you pick up something, amen, a burden of someone while you're worshiping. And then what do you do? You begin to pray in the spirit for them. You don't have to know what they're going through. Holy Ghost does. Holy Ghost just needs you to voice what his will is in other tongues. Amen. Brother, sister, I tell you, I cannot express it enough how powerful tongues is. It's literally like a nuclear explosion that goes off when you begin to pray other tongues. So Paul's saying, you, you, you are a spirit-like being. You have on the armor of God. It is an armor of light. And, ha and, and as you have it all in place, amen, in your position of prayer, then you begin to pray the kingdom of God.
of the earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Huh? Amen? Um, there was a, remember what I told you this a while back when, when I was teaching on taking back the soul. There it was when the Lord had took these prayer warriors into the spiritual plane and a minister of the gospel was dying in the hospital room and so the sister was wondering Lord what do you want me to do so the Lord said praying other tongues so she began to pray other tongues and without then an angel of the Lord appeared the angel said follow me so she stepped up out of her body while her body stayed there on the hospital bed praying and so she followed the angel and she went down through different corridors you know on the spiritual plane this is not in hell you know but the enemy has places on the spiritual plane where there are many many thousands of souls that are being tormented both Christian and and non-Christian. And she and and she said she walked past. She said she walked past this, and she said we was in some type of sewer, and she said we walk. I walked past these souls in beds, and it looked like a hospital. She said, but we wasn't in the hospital. We was on the spiritual plane. I was in my spirit body, and these were souls in beds that looked just like they were in the hospital. They had IVs and everything. And, and, and the moaning, the crying that was going on, she some so, so undescribable. She said, she just, it, 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 it did something, did something to, to me, she said. I mean, just all the way to her bones. And they finally, she kept finally uh, following the angels. They, she, they finally... Uh, it emptied over into this room where there was the, this pastor laying in this bed. She said, it looked just like a hospital bed. And these demons were around him chanting. You know what they were chanting? Dear Satan, let your will be done in hell as it is on the earth. Amen. And this past as he laid there in a fetus position in pain. Then the angel said, now take your authority and bind all those demons that were standing around. And she opened her mouth and bind all the demons that were standing around and boom, suddenly she was back in the hospital and the pastor set up in the bed. It's totally free and delivered. Brother says, why is it so important now? Because this is what we this is what we're moving into right now. God, remember what the scripture says concerning Jesus. Jesus said, I came to set the captive free. Now the scripture, the word of God is washed seven times. There's seven depths of revelation. You got to think beyond just, you're looking at someone and say, oh, they're bound by a spirit. They're bound by habits. They are also bound on the spiritual plane by the enemy. And the Lord came to set the captive free. Well, it's you that he's going to use to do it. Amen. This is why the Lord must restore your soul. Because as you move on the spiritual plane, in the spirit realm, um, the enemy constantly is looking for access to you. So the scripture says to you and I, pray, pray what? That his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
God's will for you is written in heaven. God's real will for whoever you are praying for, whoever God sent you to, God's will for them is written in heaven and you need to pray it to the earth. But we need the supernatural power of God to get it done. Amen. So Paul goes on and says, and watching there unto what all perseverance, you know, Christians, I tell you, we give up too easily. perseverance and supplication for all saints. Amen. For all saints. I'm talking about the saints here. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the saints. So, Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Now, I don't know if you realize and if you counted in our studies, the Roman soldier had seven pieces of armor. All right? But yet, the seventh piece that I'm going to talk about tonight, you may have never heard it mentioned before. I've heard it mentioned before, but I've heard it called something else. So, through this weapon, this particular weapon, you have power to stop major obstacles from developing not only in your life but in others' life. What is it called? The lance. L-A-N-C-E. When you're, when you're home tomorrow sometimes, you know, Google Roman soldier and, and Google lance. L-A-N-C-E. Now there's various kinds of lances. The Roman soldier's lance varied in size and in shape. Now the old Greek lance used was normally made of ash wood. It was normally about six to seven feet long. Having a solid iron head at the end. And then the iron head, you know, it varied in shape. Often it looked like, shaped like a leaf. A, a a bulrush or a sharp, sharp barb. Some lances were small. They were used for gouging the enemy. Other was extremely long. So most soldiers carried both. So when the enemy was hit with the longer one, he ran to him with his sword, the soldier did, and cut off the enemy's head. Roman soldiers, again, were killing machines. They were brutal. Brutal. And it was no, it was not by chance that, again, Paul, um, he spiritualized you with the Roman soldier. But not just with the Roman soldier, but with the clothes that he wore. If you ever see, if you ever see a warring angel, you're going to be shocked. They're dressed just like Roman soldiers. Just like them. But they are ineffective without you. Without the lance of prayer. Amen. The longer lance, again, was called a pilum. P-I-L-U-M. It was also used when the soldier was fortified in an encampment. You'll see many times when, when the Roman soldiers, when they were being tackled, or arrow, arrows was being showered down on them, they would put their, put their shields together in an encampment to protect themselves. And that's when the lance came in to keep the enemy from getting close, too close rather than wait for the enemy to come and attack. Thus striking him to the ground before they attack. So this six feet lance was made, some of them were made of solid iron. And so now keep this in mind now. As you well know by now, the lance 
was the lance of prayer. One of the, again, there was different types of lances. One that the soldier had up close. One that he could throw. But he could do a whole lot of damage to the enemy. In the same way, we have various kinds of prayer. And so in this study, we want to look at the different types different kinds you say well what does that have to do with spiritual armor well because in discussing the lands Paul sees all kinds of shapes and sizes and by revelation he compares all the various lances to the various kinds of prayer that God has made available to us alright now notice verse 18 again the term with all prayer praying with all prayer as taken from the Greek phrase the opus d-i-a-p-a-s-e-s meaning surrender concentrates consecration dedication all right so it would be better translated with all kinds or all types of prayer now notice again, it's something very important about it to be, to be consecrated and dedicated to the Lord. Even it's it's one of those. It's 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 why I believe. Okay, I believe. The reason Christians are not successful in prayer, two reasons. Many of them don't think it works. For one thing, anything that you believe works, you'll work it. Then number two, their lack of yieldedness. You have to, when you talk about consecration, dedication, you have to yield yourself to the Lord in prayer. You have to yield yourself. Remember, when Jesus was in the garden, that's what Jesus prayed when he didn't want to go to the cross. He prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. That was a prayer of consecration and dedication. So what did he do? He yielded himself to the will of the Lord. So yielding this is a very important thing spiritually. In the same way, let me, let me, let me, give, me give it an example. You may not think it's no big deal, but it is. When you Remember the time we talked when we were talking about, about entering into the spirit realm, going into the door. If you practice, when you practice quieting yourself, waiting on the Lord, focusing, focusing on the Lord, if you don't learn how to yield, yield in your quietness, you won't be able to enter in if you don't learn how to yield. Part of that, part of that, part of that, remember, part of yielding is relaxing. Seriously, if you, when you're waiting on God, if you're all tense, <laughs> all tense and can't relax, and so that means, guess what? Your, you have to get a hold of your mind because your mind plays a very important part in you what? Relaxing and yielding. Right? If I come up to you in the natural, listen, all truth of paradise. If I come up to you the natural to grab you, if you stiff up and resist me, I can't pull you, right? But if you relax and yield, I can pull you like a leaf. It is the same way spiritually. Because it's the Holy Spirit or the angel of God that comes and helps you and pulls you in. See? So first of all, you have to get a hold of your mind. You have to quiet your mind. You got to steal your mind. Then you got to relax. Relax, almost limp, and yield. And then focus on the Lord. Amen. And the pull will pull you right out. In the same way, 
when it comes to prayer. See, because we know not what to pray for as we are. Huh? You don't know how, unless the Lord is standing beside you and the angel is standing beside you telling you what to pray, you don't know how to pray. So Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. So you have to yield. Yield to him. Now listen. <coughs> Tongues comes by inspiration. Okay? By inspiration. Your inspiration is released more when you yield. Y'all understand? Or you can go through tongue and say the same tongue. You know, let's say your tongue in English is giddy up. Giddy up, 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 your whole hour prayer. Giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up. Guess what? You ain't going nowhere. See? When you yield, when you yield and you allow Holy Spirit to begin to mesh with your spirit, inspiration, and then Holy Spirit through inspiration, amen, and as he hits your thought life, amen, then your tongue begins to vary. Just like when you speak your mother language, your thought is engaged. And your tongue begins to go certain places in your mouth, amen, automatically. Your thought is engaged. It has become automatic. Right? Unless you are contemplating. When you're contemplating, then your tongue begins to work as your thoughts comes and your thoughts are formed. Then your words begin to form. It's the same way spiritually. So, consecration, dedication. Dedicated to the goal. Get it dedicated to what God wants. Huh? Making your prayer time be effective, not wasteful. I must be asleep tonight. So, as you put all your weapons to work, Paul encourages you to take up the final one, the final one, which is what? The lance of prayer. Prayer. He said, praying always, after you've already gone through all of the weaponry, describing them. So, the question is then, which one are you going to use in any given situation? Okay? And then name, let me name some. You have the prayer of faith. You have the prayer of agreement. You have the prayer of intercession. You have the prayer of supplication. You have the prayer of petition. You have the prayer of thanksgiving. And you have united prayer. And all of them are governed by different rules. Amen. Like I had one preacher say uh, uh, years and years ago, somebody asked him, well, prayer is prayer, ain't it? <laughs> See, when people think about prayer, they only think, they only think about the launching pad of prayer, and that's the talking part. That's all they think about. Well, he said, well, sports is sports, ain't it? Do you play all sports by the same rule? No, you don't. See, we try to take the prayer, the rules of the prayer of faith and try to rule, use them with the rules of, rules of the prayer of intercession. You can't do it. See, because 
Listen, legally speaking, let me, just, let me just hit this. It's not on my notes. But legally speaking, legally speaking, just like you can cover a child who is in the state of innocence, naturally so, you can do many times spiritually so. Like when my kids were small, I would tell them all the time, one day my faith is not going to work for you. I tell them that all the time. They come to me, I pray the prayer of faith, boom, just like that. They get here instantly. But one day I couldn't do it. Why? Because they had to use their own faith, learn to use their own faith. See, so if I'm going to pray for them now, I have to use what? Another different lens. So what would I do? I would get faith into them and I use the lens of agreement. Okay, now let's agree. Can you agree with that? And most of the time when it comes to uh, uh, people who are, just Star Watch sinners, you know, and um, that don't know God. You don't be able to use it prayer of faith. If you're not around them. Now, because they don't know God and the innocence, you can get straight up non Christians, heathens. Here quicker than you can Christians. Because healing is the children's bread. It's our bread. When you get ready to eat, you just pass the bread. That's all you do. But healing, God put healing in the church for the church to do what? Heal the world with, not themselves. So you can get them here fat, but see, but you have to believe that. These signs shall follow them that what? Believe. If you don't believe, they ain't following you. See? So most of the time, Christians, you supplicate for. Sinners, you intercede. Supplicate means what in the Greek? Beg favors. Jesus, do, do me a favor. So and so is all messed up. Do this for me, Lord. Now, what increases the Lord's chance of doing you a favor? You have a favor with Him. <laughs> Your life must be such where you have favor with Him. Amen? So. Again, so without a prayer life, you will never be effective in the kingdom of God. Ever. Ever be effective. I don't see how Christians survive without prayer, without talking to God. Like Junji, like, um, not Junji Lake, but, um, the old Pentecostal preacher made the statement God can do nothing in the earth unless someone asks him so that's the way he designed it because he gave the earth to the children of men it's on a lease amen so our victory as children of God has already been won but we appropriate it and receive directions through prayer. And different situations may require different types of prayer. Just like you can put two people in front of you, both have the same disease. One have a demon and the other one not. And one that don't have a demon, you try to cast out a demon, guess what? The person won't get here because you're praying wrong. 
and then if one do have a demon and you praying, Lord, heal so-and-so. Well, you can't heal that demon. It's got to be cast out because you're praying wrong. See, so we need Holy Spirit to lead us. How often should we pray? Again, notice Paul uses the phrase praying always. Jesus said, man, Paul said, man should always what? Pray and not what? Faint, lose heart. Now again, praying other tongues, because there's different, there are different uses of tongues. Okay? If you, you know you need to you know you need to, to pray pray for something or someone and you feel like you don't have it all together then what do you need to do? You need to build yourself up. So what do you need to do? You need to go pray in other tongues for at least an hour. Jews said build yourself up on your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in tongues don't give you faith because you got to take faith to pray in tongues but it builds you up just like you go to the gym whenever you go. Most of us just drive by it. But whenever you go to the gym, you go in there and work out, you're building your muscles. That's what praying in tongues does. It's stirring you up. See? You understand what I'm saying? For instance, your spirit man, why do you think the Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water? When people pray for you or preachers pray for you, put your hand on your bed because your spirit in your body is in a mist form. You see the you ever seen mist like comes off of a tea kettle? Ooh, when it's hot, you see the mist comes up? Your spirit is in a mist form right here in your belly. Right there. But when you stir it up, you begin to worship God. It takes shape just like your body. That's why you, you feel it all over you then. See, so when you begin to pray, you stir yourself up like Papa. See, and whatever God has put inside of you at that moment now, it begins to try to press from that rim into this rim upon your mind. Jesus has been made unto us what? Wisdom. You need to stop saying, I don't know. I don't understand. Amen. That'll stop it from moving from there to here. I can. I can. I can do all things through Christ. I may not know now. But I will know. You need to change your conversation. Change the way you talk. Amen. Amen. Confession of faith has a very important part when it comes to prayer. When Lazarus was dying, they came and told Jesus, the first thing Jesus said was what? This sickness is not unto death. Right? So Jesus spoke the destiny of Lazarus before he ever got to it. Right? but he knew what the will of the Lord was. This is why <clears throat> if it's in, at all possible, you should not pass a day by without spending time with the Lord. Amen. It's again, it's, again, it's about yielding. It's about the Lord getting information to you. See, because as you lay in bed at night, as you lay in bed at night, the Holy Spirit writes the purpose of God upon your heart. And the angels are looking at it. They see the purpose of God. They know what the purpose of God is for you. At that moment, at that time, at that day, or in that situation, or whatever it is. So those angels now begin to go about do what? Bring that purpose to pass. But they need you. 
Amen. Yielding, again, yielding to Holy Spirit helps you do what? Interpret your tongues. You need to learn to interpret your tongues in prayer. Yielding to Holy Spirit step again faith faith the element of faith is always there many times one of the ways God want to talk back to you is through your own mouth it's the spirit of prophecy that's why Paul said pray that you may prophesy But again, it goes back to two major things. You spending time waiting and yielding. Yielding has a lot to do with it. The Holy Spirit's ability to press into you the purpose of God and you pick it up. Right? Just like when the Holy Spirit moving and we worshiping. And if the Holy Spirit wants to talk, whether it be prophecy or tongues, first you're going to sense what? An inspiration. But guess what? If you're not yielded, it will be there and it will pass you by. You won't pick it up. It's just like being on the right frequency in a radio. You got all that static. But your, your eye got to become single. Your spirit, man, we got to become single. Your spirit be flooded with light. And then what? You pick up the inspiration. Huh? Here's the Corinthians church. A carnal, straight up carnal church. We know they were because Paul told them in 1 Corinthians 3. But every time they came together, they had a prophecy, a tongue. Because Paul got on them about it. He didn't say their prophecy in tongue was wrong. He said they had so much prophecy in tongue, they were coming there trying to out-tongue and prophesy each other. <laughs> he said, let everything done be decently in order. While you prophesy, somebody else gets something, and you shut up and let them give it. But they were carnal. He told them. He said, y'all act just like unsaved people in the third chapter what were they doing they had it when they got to church how did they get it by spending time with the Lord before they got to church and when they got to church in worship then they released it amen that's how Paul encouraged himself in the Lord with songs. That's how he encouraged himself. He yielded to Holy Spirit in worship. And by inspiration, he spoke out psalms out of his own mouth that encouraged him through the spirit of prophecy. Oh, that's prayer, y'all. See, there are elements that we're missing for the major part of encouragement. Because I'm going to tell you, in these days, if you, if, if, I, 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 I guarantee you, one of your biggest battles that you've been having lately is in, needing encouragement. Well, you got the biggest encourager on the inside of you, Holy Spirit. James said, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you need not that anyone teach you. You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know of all things. He's on the inside of you. 
you got to yield in prayer. Stir yourself up. In these coming days, a major part of your weapon would be encouragement. learning how to interpret your tongues. So Holy Spirit encourage you through your own mouth. So again, Paul used the phrase praying always. Okay? The word always is taken from the Greek word in pantakaro. You know, that ain't heard pronounced, so let me spell it. E-N-P-A-N-T-I-K-A-I-R-O. The word E-N is better translated at. The word panty, P-A-N-T-I, means each and every. The word Cairo means time or season. So when you put it all together, he's relaying the idea at every season, at every opportunity, at each possible moment, Anytime you have a chance, seize that time to pray. That's what he's saying. When he's saying praying always. So, all right, real quickly. The New Testament uses six different Greek words for prayer. Six different Greek words for prayer. Now, they can be categorized in these categories prayer of consecration prayer of petition prayer of urgent need prayer of thanksgiving prayer of supplication and prayer of intercession now we're going to take these be taking these one by one dealing with this one. So let's live with the first one and then we'll be done. The prayer of consecration. All right? The most common word for prayer is taken from the Greek word P-R-O-S-E-U-C-H-E. The most common word. It is used 127 times in the New Testament. It is the compound of two words. All right? Pros, P-R-O-S, which means face-to-face -face or intimate relationship. See what I mean when I say yielding? Huh? Face-to-face -face or intimate relationship. It's like, the, like a dance. Two people to dance. It's an art, right? Both of you are yielding. But you're not stepping on each other's toes. And you're gliding together. I'm talking more like the, the waltz now. Not this, not this stuff they call dancing in there. When you're face to face, holding each other. Huh? This, this word is also used in John 1 and 1. The word. The word with. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with. Okay? The second part of the word is E-U-C-H-E. -E. It's an old word meaning a wish, desire, prayer, or vow. Okay? Remember, this, used, this word is used 127 times in the New Testament. The most common word for prayer in the New Testament. Face to face, wish, desire, prayer, or vow. So the word was originally used to depict a person who made some kind of vow to God. That's what you see in the Old Testament. The Old Covenant, they knew very little about spiritual things. So when God was telling them, making a vow, keeping their vow, he was talking about them talking to him, prayer.
See? Now, in a vow, now listen to this. They gave him something of great value for an answer to prayer. They did it a lot in the Old Testament. Like Hannah. The greatest thing you have to give to God is yourself. That's why I said yield. That's where favor comes from. Your love for God grows so to such a level. When your love grows, your prayer ability increases. Remember concerning Samuel, the Bible said, not one of his words fell to the ground. That's awesome. That means he had to be so yielded to God. He was so controlled by God. He didn't ask God or pray anything that was not the will of God. It was the same with Jesus. Yielding. Yielding is a valuable part in your lesson of prayer. And you cannot yield effectively and successfully without your love growing. You won't give yourself to someone that you don't care about. Prayer is really a love relationship. Starting off with God and your walk with God, your communication with God was only about you. Ah, why, why? I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. Right? Love relationship. All you think about is you. Like the shooter might want. In the Song of Solomon. Watch her relationship grow from the beginning of the Song of Solomon to the end. In the beginning, it was all about her. Near the end, it was all about him. her beloved so when your love relationship grows the Lord sees you as his he owns you but a lover won't take you by force our lack of yielding hinders our communication God's ability to answer us and respond to us As your love and yieldingness grows with God, your prayer ability increases and to get an answer increases. Because you move from the realm of selfishness to thy will be done, thy kingdom come. That's why the scripture says if you seek the kingdom, everything else will be added to you. That's why it says that. You won't have to be asking God for stuff. He'll give it to you. Because he know you need it. In a real relationship, you're kingdom minded. You're only thinking about what he wants. Look at first Samuel. First Samuel one. Remember we mentioned Hannah. Look at Hannah. And she vowed a vow. See, she's praying. Remember, under that relationship, under the old covenant, if God, I'll do this if you do this. She vowed a vow and said, Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaiden, remember me. 1 Samuel 1, verse 11. Remember me and not forget thy handmaiden, but will give unto thy handmaiden a man child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Before she had the child, she made him a Nazarite. 
the vow of a Nazarite, which was Samuel, what, what Samson had, no razor came upon their head. But a Nazarite, somebody was a Jesus was a Nazarite. Now he's the one. He was from Nazareth, but he was a Nazarite because Jesus came eating and drinking. As a Nazarite, you don't drink alcohol. You don't drink wine. Samson was not supposed to drink wine. <laughs> Nor razor come to his head. And as it came to verse 12, and as it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli mocked her mouth. In other words, he looked at her. Her mouth was moving, but when those words coming out. So here's this backslidden prophet. No longer yielded to God. He should have knew. He was the gatekeeper. He should have knew her heart. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart, only her lips moved. But her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. <laughs> and Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah, Hannah, and Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaiden for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli, Eli answered and said, Go in peace. Now listen, he don't even know what her petition is. Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, because she was fasting. And her countenance was no more sad. So she believed the priest of God. And they rose up in up in in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord, her and her husband, and returned and came to the house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Anna had conceived, she shall bear a son and call his name Samuel saying because I have asked him of the Lord she got it because she asked now here again this is what you have to understand there's no randomness brother sister in the spirit realm. listen to me very carefully there's no randomness in the spirit realm God don't think God don't do things like you. Whoop, well, spare a moment. Okay, I'll try this. I'll try that. God don't do that. So that means something was directing her all along. You know what I'm saying? God knew she would ask for a son. God knew he would give her Samuel. This is not random. Something was directing her life. Now look at her life. A life surrendered to the Lord. Brother, sister, when you yield yourself to the Lord, the Holy Spirit will start directing your life down the path that God has you on. And the Holy Spirit will start prompting you to pray the will of the Lord for yourself. And things will start happening and coming into your life only what, what the will of the Lord wants. Remember, there's no randomness. Our lack of yielding take us off course, take us down paths we should not go down, get us involved in stuff we should not be involved in, 
how can the kingdom of God come in that if that is not the will of God for you God can only bless you as much as he can simply because he's good and you're his child but you tie his hands and you walk down paths you should not walk stuff coming into your life that should not come But when you yield yourself to the Lord, yield yourself to him in prayer. Yield yourself to him according to his word. See, you're yielding. Then Holy Spirit will begin to move in you and take you down the path only that you should go down. And in going down those paths, he will lead you to pray in tongues only what you need to pray. And you'll find your life aligning with Holy Spirit. I'm telling you this, brother and sister, this is how I lived my life. This is how I know what God wants. This is how I learned to do what God wanted me to do. It wasn't difficult. It wasn't me getting alone and God was just, you know, scringing. What's God will? What's God will? It was just an automatic knowing. As I walked with God, I automatically knew. And I automatically know what, what, what to pray for. I might not know what the answer was, but I knew what to pray for. And I prayed in other tongues. And the Holy Spirit, just like, and of course, he don't, he don't get in your body and force you, but just like someone in your body, amen, you begin to move in the direction that you need to go. It's an automatic thing. On all thy ways do what? Acknowledge him, and he will do what? Direct your path. He meant what he said. While you ain't praying in other tongues, your spirit prayer. Your spirit is talking to God. God will direct your path. This is the lens of prayer. So, a person seeking the answer to prayer will offer God a gift of thanksgiving in advance. This was an act of releasing faith. That's what Anna did. Before prayer was made, another altar was set up and thanksgiving was offered on that altar. This was called, excuse me, votive, V-O-T-I-V-E, offering from the word vow. They would set up an altar and make a vow to the Lord. And then they will set up an altar of thanksgiving and thank God for answering that vow or that prayer. It was similar to a pl pledge. And once the prayer was answered, the person would be back to give additional thanksgiving. Remember the blind? When they left, and Jesus said, were there not ten cleansed? Only you, one, came to return to give thanks to God? Now watch this. Jesus told, now these were lepers. They were cleansed, but guess what? Body parts didn't come back. Because with lepers, parts fell off. Nose, fingers, right? But when the one came back, with thanksgiving, the other side of prayer, Jesus said, go thy way, thou art made what? Whole. His parts came back after leprosy had eaten the way. So, so a person again willing to sacrifice anything to get their prayer answered. Well, 
Let me read the first part of this. I, I jumped in the middle of it. So this tells us several important things about prayer. First, it should bring us face to face with God. Right? Spending time, intimacy, yielding. It's more than a formula. Prayer should be intimacy. A person is willing to sacrifice anything to get their prayer answered. Because when you talk about kingdom praying, it's for the king. And the king is going to use you in some aspect to get that prayer answered. So, this is the altar of sacrifice and consecration where we vow to give ourselves freely to God. That's why he saved you. That's why he armed you with this prayer arm. That God could do it without us. But he included us in his inheritance. Right? So God says, apart from you becoming like me, that's the overcomer's life and obedience. Apart from you becoming like me, but he didn't stop there. If you help me bring the kingdom to earth, then I have rewards for you. In addition to me, I have rewards. I have things to give you. Amen. That's already been predetermined. Already been predetermined. So that means you must walk a particular path in order to get them. So, so the word tells us God wants us to do more than God wants to do more than just bless us. Because you know, a blessing is just the, the presence of God that comes upon you and spiritually strengthen you. But guess what? It dissipates. Just like the food you eat leaves your body and you have to eat some more. Well, you should be living off blessing and blessing and blessing. That's little kids. Amen. So, to get any answer to prayer, to get any answer to prayer, we should be willing to surrender what, how does God want me to, want to use me to, to answer this prayer? You should be willing to surrender and give thanks. This is the meaning the word prayer carries. Surrender and give thanks. See, this is the first land coming face to face with God. Come on, stand. Holy Father, we just thank you tonight that we can find favor with you. The more we are willing to surrender and to yield, the more we find favor with you. To literally trust you. It's not a blind trust because we know that you are faithful. We 
we know you have our best interests at heart. So tonight, we consecrate ourselves and dedicate ourselves to you afresh. We lay ourselves on the altar tonight. Our prayer tonight, let this be your prayer tonight. Let your will be done in me. Let your kingdom come in me. In the name of Jesus. Now come on, lift up both hands and thank him for it. Give thanks for it. We thank you for it, Lord. We consecrate ourselves afresh and anew to you. Believing that you will move every hindrance and every stumbling block that will take us off the path. that will keep us from praying right. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for the inspiration of Holy Spirit that when we pray in other tongues, you inspire us to pray rightly. And we thank you for the unction to prophesy in the name of Jesus. You told us to be not drunk with wine where it's excess, but be filled. And one of the ways we are filled with the Spirit is speaking. Speaking in other tongues. We drink of the Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. So I pray, Lord, that you help them not let these things slip, but to practice them. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Well, I pray you got something out of that tonight.